may be seated. Good morning to everybody. Um, before we get started, I have got uh, two quick things that I want to or need to make everybody aware of. Uh, the first thing is uh, this coming Sunday, December the 3rd, at Southside Church of Christ in Rogersville, they're having what they call their Super Sunday. It's kind of like our friends and family day. Uh, it's a big time of worship that they have. They've got a guest speaker coming in. Uh, and as most of you know, if you're here on Tuesday night, uh, some of the men from Southside were here uh, helping lead us in worship. Uh, and at that time, they invited us to come. And so I just want to extend that invitation on behalf of them to all of you uh, and let you know that they would love to, to see you there. They'd love to have you there. Uh, there was a slide going through the announcements today that's got some of the information on it. Uh, but their service is going to be at 10 o'clock. There's going to have, they're going to be a lunch, a uh, dinner at 1 o'clock, and then another service at 2.30. So there's ample opportunities for, for us to uh, participate in what we've got going on here that morning and get there for the afternoon. Uh, don't just show up for lunch. Uh, show up for one of the services and worship with them, uh, although I'm sure that the food will be uh, worth the trip alone. Uh, but we would love to, to support them because they've been so good in supporting us whenever we've had uh, worship services where we've invited them. Uh, the second thing that we need to be aware of is uh, in the gym this morning, uh, Allie and Christian have done a great job of tran transforming uh, the gym a little bit into uh, whatever it is, Who Whoville, is that where the Grinch story takes place? Uh, but they've got some backdrops and stuff up there. It looks really cool. Stop by there and take a look. They do an excellent job of just being creative in the ways that they engage our, our children, our young people. But they're going to be going into a series over the month of December uh, called How the Grinch Found Christmas. And so all of the children during their children's class time are going to be in the gym. But what Allie asks is that you take your kids to their class, the class that you take them to every Sunday, and that you pick them up from that class. That will help the traffic flow and help us be able to check the students in uh, the proper way and everything instead of just bringing everybody straight to the gym. So drop your kids off at class, pick them up in class or from their class. Uh, as soon as your class time is over this morning. Let me see a show of hands. How many people picked up the Thanksgiving newspaper? Nobody? <laughs> Nobody. Newspaper business is dying. All right. Well, newspapers, as we know, like they're, they're kind of going away. Uh, nobody really receives the daily newspaper anymore. But the Thanksgiving newspaper is said to be the most successful selling newspaper of the whole year. And why is that? It's because of the articles, right? It's because they write such good articles in the Thanksgiving newspaper. No, it's the sales paper. Everybody wants to see the ads, the sales paper. So Thanksgiving is a time of year where we focus on the things that we are thankful for. We recognize just how blessed we've been by our Father. Uh, but for right or wrong, it also serves as a springboard into a new season, doesn't it? It serves as a springboard into the season of gift giving and gift receiving right? We get kind of uncomfortable about that. And we don't really like that. We don't really like that there's this importance placed on gift giving and gift receiving uh, in the Christmas season, but that's just sort of the reality. That's sort of the reality that we live in. Um, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, gift giving and gift receiving. Uh, as we go into our, our month of December next month, uh, some of you may have seen on the announcements, but we're going to do a series called Exactly What I Needed, focusing on the ways that followers of Jesus receive these good gifts from Christ. So Christ's presence in the lives of believers, Christ's presence in the world today, that, that this Christmas story that we're blessed with. Um, it, there's just so many good things that come from Jesus' presence in the lives of his believers. And so we're going to focus on some of those things uh, in the coming weeks. But before we do that, I thought this morning it would be appropriate to sort of introduce us into that series that we're going to take a look at in December. If we just focus on Jesus Christ as the perfect gift to the world. Jesus Christ, the introduction of the Messiah, God himself, into the world as God's perfect and good gift to mankind. So that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. Now, I'm not a very good gift giver. Not a very good gift giver. So my family uh, will dump out that Thanksgiving newspaper uh, after everybody's eaten the, the turkey and we've played some games of Rook and done some things like that. We spend our time together. Then we'll turn the football game on in the living room. And as tradition, my mom will dump out, just sort of dump out in the middle of the living room floor, 
that Thanksgiving newspaper and everybody begins to grab their sales ads that they're interested in. So the women, they grab the Bed Bath & Beyond and the Belk and Pottery Barn and things like that. And the men, we grab the Cabela's and the Larry's Pawn and Pistol and Best Buy and things like that. Everybody starts to thumb through and the Christmas lists begin to form because everybody wants to give and to get a great gift, right? And so we look through those sales catalogs for the things that we want and things that we need. But more importantly, hopefully, uh, what we're doing is we're starting to look through there and look for some things that I can give you as my family or as my friends, some things that I can bless you with that's going to brighten your day on Christmas morning. We all want to give that perfect gift, right? I'm just not very good at that. I'll get these ideas in my head and I'll think, this is going to be a fantastic gift, this is going to be a great gift, and then when it comes to the opening, the unwrapping, it always sort of seems to fall flat. But some people are just great at giving good gifts, right? Some people just have a knack for being able to give the perfect gift. I saw the perfect gift opened on Christmas morning about 15 years ago. My mom is a great gift giver, um, but this one particular year she outdid herself. Now, she gave my dad a present, and dad gifts on Christmas are kind of predictable, right? Dad gifts are ties, grill tools, and flannel shirts. Those are the things that we give our fathers, right? But my mom broke the mold this Christmas 15 years ago. And on Christmas morning, she comes out, and she has these squares about this big, wrapped flat, and three of them. And she gives them to my dad. And I remember he was sitting on the couch, and he begins to tear into the wrapping paper, and he opens them up. And what it is is three paintings. It's a series of paintings, and they weren't just any paintings, but they were these beautifully framed and matted paintings of the Flint River. It's the river that my dad grew up on, a river that he spent all of his time as a child playing and fishing. And there were specific spots in the river uh, that are sort of landmark spots. If you grew up in that area, you know uh, there's sort of the, the Flint River Dam where people will go and fish and there's another area that's great for picnics and swimming holes and it was a series of paintings that sort of represents these special spots in the Flint River, a river that meant so much to my dad as a, as a boy. And so he takes a look at these paintings and I'll never forget him sitting there on the couch and just his eyes started to glass over and he's just speechless. He doesn't know what to say and through quivering, quivering words he tells my mom, Thank you. And for the rest of that Christmas morning, while everybody's opening their presents, my dad is sitting there and he's looking at these paintings. And he starts to tell stories about how he and his dad used to go to this exact spot in the painting and they would fish and they would talk all day. And he sits there for the whole morning and he just looks at the beauty that is the perfect gift. We have been given a perfect gift by our Father in Jesus Christ. A gift that I think demands a similar response as what my, dad's, what my dad saw that, or what I witnessed in my father that Christmas morning. A response that just says, thank you. Thank you. So what goes into making the perfect gift? As I said, I'm not a great gift giver, but if there's anything that you're not very good at, if there's something that you're bad at, uh, I guarantee you this, you could type it into Google or you can get on YouTube and you can find somebody that's going to help you get better at what the, whatever that thing is, right? Giving gifts is no different. There is tons and tons of blogs and websites where people have compiled these lists of tips and things to help you be a better gift giver if you're just not that great. And so uh, about a year or two ago, I remember searching for some of these things. So I want to get Natalie a great Christmas present. Uh, and there's tons of websites on what to get your wife for, for Christmas or what to get your husband for Christmas that'll really wow them on Christmas morning. But there was one thing that I remember seeing and I, and I kind of wrote this stuff down and I thought, that is easy. I can do that. It wasn't a list of actual like products to give them. It was just a little checklist and it was simple. It was three things and it said, if you can do these three things, if you can buy a gift that, that checks off in each three of these areas, then you've got the perfect gift. And so what I want to do this morning is share some, just those three tips with you. And I want to talk about the way that we see God's perfect gift of Jesus Christ to the world matching up with the perfect gift scenario. So the first thing it says is this. If you want to give the perfect gift, it's got to be surprising. It can't be one of those things that we do, uh, kind of like my family's Christmas morning where you thumb through the, the sales catalogs and you say, here you go, here's my list, here's the things that I need, get me these things. And then on Christmas morning, surprise, it's all of those things, right? There was no real wonder in it, there was no real 
surprise. It was just, I said what I needed, and you got it for me. But the perfect gift, the internet says, uh, doesn't work that way. There's got to be an element of surprise. It can't be something that's anticipated. So how does Jesus match up with this? Jesus, our Savior, our God, love who has come down into the world, is nothing if not surprising. He's nothing if not absolutely surprising and unexpected. Now, the Jewish people for, for hundreds of years have anticipated the coming of a Messiah. That, that wasn't a surprise. That wasn't something that was unexpected. The people knew that a Messiah was coming. The prophets had been very, very clear about this. But Jesus' embodiment of this Messiah was absolutely surprising and unexpected. At, at the point in time where we said, we'll, we'll talk about this for the next few weeks, but at this point in time when Jesus is, is born into this world, the Jewish people have been through an absolute roller coaster. They've just been up and down. And there's been times where God has delivered the people of Israel, and he's been so present, and he's been so powerful in their life, and he's lifted them up to points where they are flourishing. And then there's been other times where due to their waywardness, it's felt like God was absolutely absent in their life. And they'll end up in Babylonian exile. So they've been removed from their homeland, they've been taken to a new place, and and here we have the Israelite people in exile, and finally they they get to leave the exile, and they get to go back home, and the Jewish people are scattered at this point. And eventually they'll find themselves under Roman rule. And for the Jewish people, it, it seems as though things just couldn't get worse. Right? We used to be here. God, God lifted us up and he had us at the very top of prominence and power and we were flourishing as a people. But now things couldn't be worse as we were being oppressed by the Roman government. But the Jewish people had faith. They had faith that one day God was going to rise them up again as a people. And key to that faith was the words, the promises of God that echoed through the words of the prophets. As they said, a Messiah is coming. One who will raise you back up as a people. Nick read to us this morning from Micah chapter 5. This is one of those famic, famous messianic prophecies. Uh, one of these famous lines that the people of Israel would just cling to. Uh, these promises of God that you will be raised up again. I want to read it one more time. It says, Marshal your, tro- your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers will return to to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. The Jewish people would read these prophecies and they would hear these words of God that one is being raised up, a Messiah, a Savior who will return Israel back to its rightful place of prominence and power. And in the minds of the, of the Jewish people as they would read these prophecies, there begins to be this image created of what scholars will call the warrior king. Right? The Messiah is going to be this warrior king, one who, like Scripture says, comes from ancient and old times. And he will stand in the strength of the Lord the same way that Moses stood in the strength of the Lord. In the same way that Joshua did, in the same way that David did. He will stand in the strength of the Lord and he will rule his people. And everyone will know his name from the ends of the world. And the Jewish people would think a Messiah is coming. This warrior king, he's coming and he will overthrow Rome. And once again, we will be lifted back up. But Jesus, the embodiment of this Messiah, couldn't have been more surprising as they imagine this warrior king, what they can't imagine and what's so unexpected is that this Messiah is not going to be born of royalty, but instead he'll be conceived by the Holy Spirit and he'll be brought up by a pretty average Jewish carpenter and his young wife. And as Jesus, his birth is very surprising to the Jewish people and this idea of the Messiah But his life continues that trend because his life is unexpected and his life is surprising. So as this Messiah, this supposedly warrior king, rises up and he grows up, eventually we see Jesus at his baptism. And after his baptism, Jesus begins to to speak and to preach and teach. And his teachings are just amazing people. They've never heard teachings like this. 
And then eventually Jesus begins to perform miracles and do things that no one has ever seen before. And the people become amazed by Jesus. And eventually he'll begin to heal people and he, at, the, at, a, at a touch, at a word. People's diseases will begin to vanish. The leper's skin will be cured. And the people become amazed by this. And the Bible talks about how in his hometown, people would say things like, is this Joseph and Mary's son? How in the world could it be that he does these amazing things? Jesus is so surprising. But eventually, after people have seen his, listened to his teaching, they've seen his miracles, they've seen him heal people, eventually the people begin to say, I think it's possible that this Jesus of Nazareth could be the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And so finally, as people begin to, to sort of latch on to this idea that it's possible this could be the Messiah, and Jesus once again surprises them all. Because while Israel, the Jewish people, were waiting for this warrior king to rise up and to snuff out the power of the Roman government, what we see is Jesus, the Messiah, have very little interest in starting a revolt against Rome. What we see is that he has his sights set much higher. From our hindsight, we get it, right? Jesus didn't come to overthrow the Roman government. Jesus came to over, overthrow sin and death. While Israel expected a Messiah who would offer a solution to their national problems as a people, God offers Jesus as a solution to the universal problem of people. While Israel expected a Messiah that was going to overthrow the government and bring them, rise them back up as a people, as a national power, to, to be the ease to all of their problems as a nation, as a people, God offers the perfect gift in Jesus to be a solution to the universal problem of mankind. While their expected version of the Messiah was a warrior king who would end Rome's oppression of the Jews, Jesus becomes the servant king who would end sin and death's oppression of mankind forever. Jesus is surprising in every aspect. What's so beautiful as I look at how surprising this gift of Christ to the world is, this gift of the Messiah, it's so beautiful because we see such a good father in God, right, as he offers this gift, where he doesn't give the people what they want, he doesn't give the people what they've asked for, what they've expected, he gives them what they needed. And what they needed was something much more than they could have ever dreamed. And that's exactly what our God offers through this perfect gift of Jesus. So the second thing that makes a perfect gift is this. Number one, it's got to be surprising. Number two, they say this. If you want to give the perfect gift, the gift has to, has to tell something about the giver. You've got to know something about the person who's giving the gift by what that gift is, right? So it needs to describe or, or say something about the relationship that the giver has with the recipient, okay? Jesus does this beautifully, right? What do we know about God from Jesus? We know everything. Well, everything that our minds can comprehend, right? God is so much greater than anything we could ever wrap our brains about. But we know a good deal about God. We know what his character looks like. We know what his heart looks like simply by looking at Jesus. We know the giver by looking at the gift. The book of John is unique. Um, the book of John, I think, paints a great picture of, of how we see God through Jesus. So John is written, it's the last gospel to be written, right? So a, a few uh, like decades here after Jesus' death and his ascension back up into heaven. And so the other Gospels have been written. Uh, most people think Mark first, and then Luke and Matthew offered their input, and then finally John. But they say that John is written during a time when Christians were facing a lot of persecution from the, the other Jewish believers. People were giving them a hard time for believing that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, was really the Son of God. And so they say that John is, is likely written this gospel in an effort to encourage Christians to say, no, 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 he's exactly who he says he is. He is God himself. But the very beginning of the book of John is awesome, and I think it paints a, a picture of how we see God uh, through Jesus. So the beginning of, of Mark, we sort of see like the life of Jesus just immediately gets jumped into, but Matthew... And then Luke write their Gospels, and they say, well, we need to tell a little bit more of the story. The reader, a uh, person who's trying to understand Jesus, needs to know that there is this miraculous birth. And what we see now is John saying, no, we need to zoom out even more. 
because there's something even more miraculous than this Savior, this Messiah who was born in Bethlehem in a manger. He says, it didn't begin in Bethlehem. Jesus was always there, right? Listen to what John says. In the beginning was the Word. This is John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jump down to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What I see John saying here is this, in this beautifully worded opening to his gospel. He says this, when you take a look at Jesus, the word, what you see is God himself. When you see the beauty of Jesus Christ, you see the beauty of God himself. The two are one and the same, and it's a hard concept to wrap your mind around. But know that when you see the glory of Jesus, you see the glory of God. We know the giver by the beauty and the glory of his gift. In the book of John, if you turn over, you keep going. In chapter 8, Jesus is going to say something interesting here that I think plays to this, this idea of knowing the giver by the gift. Uh, in chapter 8, uh, starting in ver verse about 14, Jesus has made some claims about himself. He does it often in the book of John, right? And he has claimed that, that he is the light of the world. And the Jewish people, the, some of the Pharisees here, they have trouble with this. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. H how can you do that? You can't just make claims about yourself. You have no witness. Who is there to back up what you're saying? And Jesus offers uh, a comment that they don't really like. Jesus basically tells them that I don't need any, any witness to back me up. My authority is from God himself. My authority is from my Father. And so they're going to ask him this question. In verse 19, chapter 8, they ask him, well then where is your Father? Listen to Jesus' response. You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. If you knew me, you would know my Father also, Jesus says. Isn't that beautiful? If you know me, the gift, the Messiah, then you know my Father. Because Jesus says, everything there is to know about God, you can see it in me. I love that. We see so much about our God, the creator God, through the life of Jesus. Basically, when we look at the gentleness of Jesus as he encounters the broken, we see the gentleness that our God has as he encounters us in our brokenness. As we see the compassion that Jesus has as he takes a look at the, the sick and the afflicted and the, and the people who are marginalized on the outside, we see the compassion that our God has for the same types of people. As we see the frustration that Jesus has when, when the Pharisees are, are using the law to oppress people, we see this frustration, I think, that God has. And we have a tendency to do the same thing sometimes today. As we take a look at the intense love and passion that Jesus has for his friends, his followers, his disciples. We take a look at the love and the passion that God has for the church today. We know the giver by the gift. We know the love of God by the giver or by the gift. So the next thing that we see is this. Not only do we just simply know God, but we know something else based on the gift. And this is a simple, fact, a simple thought, and then we'll just we'll jump on from here. But I think this is really, really important. We know, based on Jesus Christ, something about the giver. And it's this. That we are desperately loved by God. I want to say that again. For some reason, as I was studying through this, th this was the, the one phrase in this whole thing that just stuck out to me. And so I think that there's probably, there's got to be somebody in here this morning, or, or numerous people in here this morning, who need to know this and who need to hear this clearly. When we take a look at Jesus Christ, when we take a look at the gift that Jesus Christ was to the world today, what we see and what we know about God is this, that we are desperately loved by him. Sometimes we just need to know that. Sometimes we need to be reminded that God, the Almighty, the creator of this universe, is desperately 
in love with you. Ernie read this to us earlier. I want to read it again. This is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If if we have trouble wondering sometimes, does God really love me? Is God really there for me? Understand this. Take a look at the gift that Jesus Christ is to the world. Take a look at the gift that the Messiah's life is to you. Take a look at the gift that that death on the cross is and know this. You are desperately loved by your God. His love is intense. His love is passionate for you. There's no way around it. When we look at Jesus, we have to understand We are desperately loved by our God. So a gift has to be surprising. A gift has to reflect something about the giver. And then finally, uh, we come to this. A gift has to be, it cannot be something that is deserved or earned. Right? It can't be something that's deserved or earned. So we do this weird thing at Christmas sometimes, right? And I am so guilty of doing this. And I understand that uh, as families, you know, we have large families. We need to place a limit and some sort of parameter for our gift giving. And so we do this thing where we say, okay, I'll give you a $25 gift and you give me a $25 gift, right? And usually what ends up happening is I'll give you a $25 uh, Starbucks gift card and you give me a $25 Dunkin' Donuts gift card, right? And we've made this weird exchange. And there seems to be this understanding that, like, there's certainly an element of generosity in that. But there's also sort of this feeling of, well, you owe me a $25 gift, right? That's what I've given you. The perfect gift can't work within those parameters. It's got to be surprising. It's got to tell you something about the heart of the giver. But it also has to be undeserved or unearned. It doesn't work within the confines of, you give me this and I'll give you that. Perfect gift is not something that we can earn. God's offering of his son and Jesus' offering of himself serves as the perfect example of an undeserved gift. This is Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. Not after we've been made clean. Not after we've come to him and we've spent a life dedicated to his service. No, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of the cross, Jesus goes to the cross for you and I. It's the ultimate undeserved gift. And thank God for that. There's nothing that you and I could do. There's no amount of task. There's no amount of love that we could show or, or, or forgiveness that we could show to ever be able to earn the gift that we received by that death that Christ died on the cross. The beauty of the whole thing is this. He's not asking us to. That's not the way the perfect gift works. He's not asking us to deserve it. He's not asking us to earn it. What he's asking us to do is simply this. Accept it. Just accept that I have offered you the perfect gift of my son Jesus Christ. Accept that his perfect life, that was so surprising, and that reveals so much about me and my heart and my love for you. Just accept it and enjoy the blessings of it perfect gift of Jesus is surprising. It tells us much about God and it is absolutely undeserving or unearned for us. Jesus Christ, this morning, if we don't understand or recognize anything, may we recognize Jesus Christ is the perfect and good gift from a good and loving Father. I want to go back to my dad as he opened up that perfect gift from my mom, those paintings that that meant so much to him. Can you imagine as, as my mom offers this gift to my dad, if he were to open those things up and take a look at them and say, this is nice. No thanks. 
No, my mom would have just wept right there. It would be the worst Christmas ever. The perfect gift must be accepted. And we've been given, we've been given this incredible gift by our God, and all he's asked is this, that we recognize it like my father, recognize the beauty that it is, and sometimes there's no response for that other than just to say, thank you. Thank you for this. Recognize it and accept and enjoy it. It's that simple. This morning, my, my guess is that there's some of us in here who have taken a look at this perfect gift of Jesus and we've said, it's beautiful, but I, but I just can't. I just can't. This morning, my urge to you is this. Let's not wait any longer. We've been offered a perfect and beautiful gift from our Father. May we accept Jesus Christ. And may we experience the blessing that comes from a life with him. May we accept the gift and may we enjoy the blessings that come from it. This morning, if you'd like to make that decision, you'd like to say, you know what, I recognize the beauty that is Jesus Christ and I'm ready to dedicate myself. To, I'm ready to receive that gift of his forgiveness, of his love, of his grace, of his mercy, and I'm ready to live a life spent enjoying it. Then I want to ask that as we stand and sing, that you come forward, let us celebrate with you and let us pray over you. Let's stand and sing.